it does seem the perfect environment really, doesn't it, for these amazing creatures and also a perfect final resting place for a king. But King Richard III's surroundings weren't always quite so grand. It was a discovery that made headlines around the world. Five years ago, a skeleton was found buried under the foundations of a council car park in Leicester. It was believed to be that of King Richard III, famously killed in battle. And experts here at the University of Leicester were called upon to unravel this ancient murder mystery. I was asked to look at the skull and it arrived in the lab with uh, various tool marks on it. And what we were interested in is working out what tools had been used to create those injuries. This large injury to the right-hand side of the base of the skull was likely to have been caused by a substantial weapon. Um, so we think this was caused by a halberd, which is a pole weapon, which has an ax uh, on the blade and would have been capable of doing this. Some of the injuries penetrated to considerable depth. So they went, for example, right through the base of the skull, through the brain and onto the inside of the skull. So we could say that that had to be a weapon that was long and thin, um, and it was likely to be a short sword or a, a long dagger. But what we found was that all the injuries that we saw were consistent with the stories that we'd heard about the battle. And they were consistent with him having been pulled off his horse in a mire, and then those final injuries being inflicted while he was um, on the ground. The physical injuries seemed to match what was known about the way the monarch had died. But to confirm that it was indeed Richard III, Professor Churi King was able to link DNA taken from the skeleton to 21st century relatives on Richard's mother's side. Richard himself had left no known living descendants. But um, we do know that he's got female line relatives who are alive today. And I can look at their mitochondrial DNA and see if it matched that of the skeleton. The DNA taken from the skeleton and the relatives alive today was practically a perfect match. The identity of the long lost king was confirmed. But what else could Richard's DNA tell us about him? At the moment, what I've been doing is I've been looking at Richard III's entire genome. Now, that was interesting for me because there's no contemporary portraits of Richard. They all post-date his death from about 25 to 30 years. But looking at somebody's genome, you can actually say probably what their eye color is and hair color. So we know that he had a 96% chance of having blue eyes and that he had a 77% chance of having blonde hair, but that would have been a childhood hair color and it could have darkened with age. Yes. But obviously you can do this sort of thing, you can apply it to crime scenes. So these are known as externally visible characteristics, so EVCs. So even without seeing the criminal, you can start to say something about what they might look like and this sort of thing. As well as using DNA to work out what people might look like, the team is developing a way to narrow down names of potential offenders by examining DNA found at crime scenes. As things progress into the future, there's only going to be more ways in which you're able to work with the police. Absolutely. It has been suggested. Now, what if we had a database that had Y chromosomes attached to surnames? And you go to a crime scene and you type the Y chromosome, you put it into your database and you see what surnames it brings up. If you've got that in someone in your suspect list yes. who's got that surname, go to them first. So it's investigative because you'd use the normal DNA fingerprinting to do the rest of the work with it. But it helps police prioritise. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about it is it doesn't have to be you that's on the DNA database as it is now, just somebody with the same surname as you and they would get that hit. It seems the possibilities of DNA analysis are endless. I want to see firsthand just how revealing this information can be. So Churi's going to take a sample of my DNA. So what is the method for testing? Right, I need to get some of your saliva, I'm afraid, <laughs> um, to get to your DNA. So what you need to do is um, spit in this rather glamorous spit kit. So you need to spit and collect saliva up to that line. That's a lot of spit, Churi. It is quite a lot of spit, so you might want to go off somewhere and just sit by yourself. When you come back, we will close that, and then from that I can extract your DNA and type your mitochondrial DNA type for you. What are you going to be able to tell about me? I can't tell you like precisely where your female line ancestry comes from, but it tells you a region. I could tell you what your eye colour is and your hair colour is. 
I can tell you whether or not you're lactose intolerant or whether or not you're sensitive to caffeine and this sort of thing. And that's just all from a bit of spit. It is. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing what you can do these days. <laughs> Well, I'm very intrigued to find out what my DNA results are. That'll be coming up later in the programme. Now, experts here in Leicester have gained a well-earned reputation for their forensic brilliance, and it's not just with ancient bones. They're actually working alongside the police to develop new technologies uh, to investigate crime. Joining me now is Professor Robert Hillman and PhD student Jody from the University of Leicester. We're going to get a little experiment going here, aren't we? So I'm going to put my fingerprint on this metal slab, and whilst the experiment is in progress, um, let's have a bit of a chat. So tell me a bit more about the work that you do, Robert. My background is in chemistry and we've been developing a number of reagents and imaging methods to reveal so-called latent or non-visible fingerprints on a range of objects uh, made of metal, paper and other substances. Now, if we look at this bullet casing, the fingerprints are clearly very, very visible on here, aren't they? Yes. So how are we going to make my fingerprints on that metal slab visible? What we have here is a reagent we've developed that contains uh, some uh, silver and all of your fingerprint uh, ridge marks that you've left on there blanket off parts of the surface. And what the silver reagent is going to do is to react with uh, all the bare copper that's in the brass and we'll have a silver deposit that will give us an image of the fingerprint. And this oh is a, a different approach to traditional methods. And that is so clear, isn't it? So is this a technique that the police forces are using at the moment? Uh, they're not using it at the moment. This is a method that we developed in the research laboratory and we're in the process of trying to transfer that technology to the practitioner laboratories. And the police have been very uh, interested in this. Well, clearly you can see it's very, very effective and it'd be brilliant to you know, work alongside the police, as we said. Am I able to take this home as a souvenir? Of course you can. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, there you go, Rob. Real state-of-the-art technology. You saw it here first.